Tudor composers wrote numerous pieces of music to be performed for the Feast of the Annunciation. This was perhaps inevitable because of the importance of the feast. At court, the Annunciation doesn't appear to have received unusually lavish treatment, unlike, say, the Feast of the Epiphany. That said, Thomas Tallis and John Shepherd wrote some fine pieces for the Chapel Royal in the 1550s. A little earlier, the composer Nicholas Ludford wrote a mass Christi Virgo Delectissima for the Royal Chapel of St Stephen in Westminster Palace. Here you see an artist's impression of the palace before the domestic ranges were burnt in 1513 and before St Stephen's Chapel was converted into the House of Commons in 1548. You'll recognise Westminster Abbey in the background and Westminster Hall just behind St Stephen's. Ludford's Mass was based on the responsory Christi Virgo Dilactissima. The same chant was set to polyphony by John Shepherd, who, like Ludford, lived in Westminster and who died a year after Ludford in 1558. Shepherd probably wrote his setting during the Indian summer of English Catholicism, the reign of Mary Tudor, also known as Bloody Mary. Mary's Chapel Royal was the engine room of the English Counter-Reformation. Using her own household chapel as a model for Latin worship, Mary hoped to roll back the English Reformation. Mary ultimately failed due to her unexpectedly early death in 1558 and the accession of her half-sister Elizabeth, but Mary left a golden legacy in the repertory of Latin polyphony by Thales, Shepherd, Bird, William Mundy, Robert Parsons and their contemporaries. This great legacy of Latin church music survives thanks largely to the Elizabethan singer John Baldwin of Windsor. The so-called Baldwin part books, now in Christ Church, Oxford, preserve Christi Virgo Delectissima along with 168 other pieces. Alas, the tenor part book is lost, and so the Tudor part books project has provided new tenor parts for around 60 pieces. You can see here one of the workings we did for Christi Virgo, where we took pre-existing reconstructions, shown here in colour, and produced a new version which conflated the best elements for each of these earlier versions. You can see the original plain song in the top voice, the triplex or treble part. This chugs away in semi-briefs, and the composer's art is in weaving imitative polyphony or fuga underneath it. The fuga has to follow the rules of counterpoint, but it mustn't sound dry and academic. You need to know when and how much to bend the rules, to take an idea and make little rhythmic or melodic adjustments so that everything fits together just so. John Shepherd was a hugely talented composer who specialised at rule-bending fuga, and sometimes Shepherd took reckless liberties. So the reconstructed tenor needs to sail just close enough to the wind. As the plain song Cantus Firmus is in the treble, or the upper voice of the polyphony, in our performance for the Feast of the Annunciation, it is also the treble singers who sing the plain song sections. Please enjoy John Shepherd's responsory Christi Virgo Delectissima, sung virtually by the choral scholars and adult singers of St Wolfram's Church Choir Grantham.
the members of St Wilfrid's Church Choir cannot meet together during the COVID-19 pandemic, we are devoting a lot of time to constructing polyphony by digital means. With singers filming their vocal parts individually, and isolated from the whole picture of everyone else's singing, it does at least give them the opportunity to focus in detail on crafting their own musical line. Through editing, it is possible to weave these individual threads into the tapestry of virtual polyphony. Although the process is painstaking and very time-consuming, it gives the opportunity for the singers and their director to explore every aspect of the music in the closest detail. Lockdown working also involves trusting the learning process and the performance to the individual responsibility of singers. Perhaps this even in some ways reconnects with the ethos of Tudor singing, where the role and decision-making of the performer, singing for their own part book, was paramount. In this time of isolation, our choristers are fully devoted to their learning, and we are looking forward to the experience of singing this music together in person as soon as restrictions ease. Vespers was one of the high points of the liturgical day. Sung in the late afternoon, it was usually given higher status than the evening office of Compline, if we judge from the quantity of polyphony that was written for it. However, this order of precedence flipped during Lent when Compline took precedence. The hymn Salvatum Undi Domine was sung at Compline throughout the year on major double feasts. In the final verse, the singers take the text for Marian feasts, referring to Christ, who was born of the Virgin, qui natus est de Virgine. In this performance, we perform the verses of the hymn in three of the formats that are known to have been used in the 16th century, as plain song, as improvised polyphony or far burden, and as composed polyphony or, to use its 16th century term, prick song. The six-part prick song here is by John Shepherd, and the far burden is based on a source in the British Library. Another alternative format, not in our performance today, was for versets to be played by the organ. Tudor organists were also master improvisers. In a busy institution, the organist might expect to play something like 11,000 versets each year. Nearly all of these were improvised and only a few were written down. Here we see a rather faint piece of notation from circa 1540. If you look carefully, you'll see the word salvator beneath the first stave. This contains a bass part upon which two voices will sing in fixed intervals, in effect a series of first inversion chords. When you do this, you find that an ornamented form of the original plain song melody reappears in the uppermost voice. A Tudor singer would call this bass part a square. You find squares copied in many late medieval service books. They are the magic template from which you can create harmonious polyphony without needing to notate all of the voice parts. In verses 3 and 5 we have recreated this practice. Please enjoy our virtual reconstruction of the Tudor Compline hymn Salvato Mundi Domine. Salvador Mundi 